In 2017, during the era of diss tracks and YouTube drama, one house would become synonymous with some of the most successful content creators at the time. That place was the Clout House, which held the Clout Gang for a few years, consisting of Ricegum, Alyssa Violet, FaZe Banks, Summer Rae, and Wolfie Raps. The Clout House was an iconic place for its time, as not only did it feature in some of the most viewed videos of the past few years, but it also functioned as a place where many bigger YouTubers would temporarily stay to further their careers. But despite how popular they once were, the exact future of the house's occupants are mostly unknown as they've gradually faded into irrelevance. In this video, I'm going to excavate the Clout House and dig down to examine the remains of his residents' careers, who they were before they joined, and what's happened to them since. Let's begin. At the end of 2016, Ricky Bankston, better known as FaZe Banks, was at the helm of a social media empire. Just three years ago, he was posting trickshot clips of Call of Duty onto his YouTube channel, but after building his way up, he proved himself as an incredibly capable owner of FaZe Clan, so much so that he had moved on to further his own career. In March 2017, Banks got a year and a half lease on a 10 bedroom house in the heartland of LA. The house, which cost $100,000 a month and was previously rented out by Justin Bieber, was now in the hands of Banks, but he never really intended for it to be a YouTube or a phase house. Instead, he had much more personal plans, chief among them being his own clothing brand Loose Change, and he needed some help with working on it. So he enlisted none other than Ricegum. Just a few years ago, Brian Lee was a decently known streamer in the gaming scene, but after the chaotic year of 2016, he had skyrocketed to over 5 million subscribers. Turns out back then there was a very big audience for making fun of cringy kids online, and tons of people flocked to his content. However, as time was passing, he seemed pretty directionless, as his new uploads mostly consisted of attempting to start drama with other YouTubers. In fact, his reputation as a content creator was pretty shaky for a number of reasons. First off, a lot of his personality revolved around diss tracks, which he'd insert at the end of his videos. However, there were always rumours that he wouldn't really write his own lyrics, and in January, those rumours were all but confirmed when someone hacked into the account of Discord, a YouTube-based rapper, and leaked all of the DMs he was sending to Ricegum. Then, when at a party inside the Cloud House in March with Gabby Hanna, Gabby approached him asking to freestyle. She then poked fun at him for a bit, and from there, two things happened. Either he threw her phone, or he hit her. This would become a huge event with many people on either side of the situation just fighting amongst themselves, but it wouldn't compare in size to what would come next in summer 2017. <sighs> Yeah. yeah, that's it. When Disney star and Vine content creator Jake Paul released It's Every Day Bro on May 31st, 2017, it went viral instantly, and everyone laughed at it. <laughs> but Jake Paul had become the most plentiful market of content for that year because he was the centre of attention everywhere on his side of the internet. His channel growth was unlike any other, his personality and pace of his vlog was something new to the table, and he was incredibly controversial. From setting fire to his pool, to bullying, to jumping on a news van, everyone had his eyes on him, and a lot of people hated him. And that's how the Cloud House's third resident entered the scene. After graduating from high school in Ohio during 2014, Alyssa Violet wasn't really too set on what to do with her future, but after meeting Jake and Logan Paul whilst they were touring, Alyssa got to know Jake personally. After months of talking, they became incredibly close, and Jake convinced her to move to LA to pursue a modelling career. This proved to be a risky but ultimately profitable decision, as Alyssa herself became a star in the Vine scene out of nowhere. Her account had reached around 600,000 before Vine shut down in January 2017, but she and Jake had already made plans for other outlets. During 2015 and 2016, she was a founding member of her friend, now turned boyfriend's company, Team 10, and had been constantly vlogging with him for months. That was all turned on its head when in February 2017, Alyssa was kicked out of the Team 10 house by Jake, amidst allegations thrown at each other over cheating and manipulation, and amplified by the subsequent Twitter argument they would have. So, um, I'm sure you guys want to know what's going on right now. Basically this, um, Jake's kicking me out. <laughs> He didn't want to wait for me to get my apartment, which I'm getting in a couple days, so he threw all my stuff downstairs and put a lock on the door. <laughs> so this is what I'm working with, and apparently I don't live in here anymore, all my stuff's like gone. You know, I want you guys there with me through life, and I'm not going to be making videos with Jake anymore, so I want to explain why. So now it's created an entire inconvenience for me because now I have to just hire a moving company and put all my stuff in storage and like it's just insane. Now usually you wouldn't have anything happen beyond this but later in May when It's Everyday Bro dropped, Jake directly targeted Alyssa on the track and it was clear that there was an opportunity. 
Not only did Banks know who Alyssa was previously, but the Jake Paul saga made her perspective incredibly valuable. So on June the 1st, Ricegum and Alyssa would collaborate on a reaction video, which has now gained over 30 million views. On June the 9th, Alyssa would post her own video talking about her experience with Jake Paul, where she told how she felt emotionally drained because Jake had been manipulating and toying with her in their relationship. And then on June the 11th, Ricegum and Alyssa Violet released It's Every Night Sis, a diss track towards Jake and Team 10. This, looking back, is the point where the Cloud House officially began. Not only does the video with almost 300 million views feature it prominently, but this is a direct attack at Jake Paul and Team 10 using music, the same medium that he had used to become famous in the first place. And with a track that became the first YouTuber made single to go platinum and hit the Billboard Hot 100, its impact can't really be ignored. And thus the Cloud House would establish themselves as the non cringy version of Team 10. Over the rest of 2017, the Cloud House would add two more to its most known permanent residents, Summer Rae and Wolfie Raps. Summer Rae was one of the most well-known Instagram fitness influencers with over 15 million followers before she moved in. Meanwhile, hailing from Canada, Wolfie Raps had gotten big off of extreme experiment and challenge videos during 2016, and there is how the main people managed to become part of the Clout House. Of course, there were celebrities who visited, such as KSI, Logan Paul, Shane Dawson, Lil Uzi Vert, Ugly God, and many, many more, but I'm only going to focus on a main five particularly, and what's happened to them since they joined. Whilst not the immediate owner of the house, Ricegum has definitely contributed towards the Cloud House getting the most attention. After all, it was featured in all of his music videos and all of his vlogs, which he started doing after his Jake Paul diss track got all of that attention. Throughout the summer, he would grind these out almost every day, and he got a boost when he started collaborating with KSI, who had left his own YouTube group Sidemen to stay at the Cloud House and trade diss tracks with his former friends. Ricegum would later feature on one of KSI's diss tracks called Earthquake, and the Cloud House was used as a filming base for KSI's Little Boy music video. However, summer wouldn't last forever and Ricegum's fortunes were turned around when one of commentary's giants came knocking. On October 3rd, 2017, iDubbbz, known at the time for his visceral takedowns of other YouTubers, would drop the 11th iteration of his Content Cop series, titled Content Cop Jake Paul, but aimed towards Ricegum. In the episode, iDubbbz systematically takes apart Ricegum's online character over the last few years in the form of Seven Deadly Sins. He talks first about Ricegum's inability to take criticism by talking about one of Ricegum's old streams from before he blew up, where he talks to a rape victim and ask some very interesting questions. Why well, he raped you? Idubs then goes over Ricegum's projection of his rapper-esque lifestyle, his lack of permission when phoning other girls for his live streams, his admission to attempting to record and then upload someone having sex with him without our knowledge, him not paying $10,000 to the winner of the clickbait challenge, his obnoxious attitude towards flexing and money, him stretching out his videos, and his general outward arrogance and pride. The video was impressive and seemed to completely obliterate any semblance of reputation that Rice had left. However, despite that, in the grander scheme of things, it wouldn't really impact Ricegum's overall numbers or career as much as some expected. For the most part, everyone still knew Ricegum was a piece of shit beforehand. He still stayed strong and in the Clout House, even filming his IDUB's response diss track, Frick the Police, in there as well. From then on, he would continue to ride the lifestyle wave out, as for him, he didn't really need drama to get views anymore, but that doesn't mean he didn't keep out of it. For example, in February 2018, YouTube animator The Odd Ones Out would make a small dig at him in one of his videos discussing materialism, and Ricegum took issue with that and managed to make an entire 7 minute video out of it. Around the same time, Ricegum would also start strip Fortnite videos, where he'd have an attractive woman next to him, and every time he would get a kill, she would remove one piece of clothing. This content, despite how degenerate it was, managed to get almost 100 million views over six videos. In March, he would also call out iDubbbz to a boxing match live on Drumroller, after previously being challenged by other YouTubers such as Rotashaw, who after being denied by Ricegum, decided to make a video and diss track on him. And yes, yes, it's that one. Good afternoon! Your mom looks like Kim Jong Un! This should actually replace the British national anthem. On June the 12th, 2018, Ricegum uploaded a video called Why I Left the Clout House. I'm sorry. But he didn't actually leave the Clout House because the video instead focuses on Ricegum's vlog in Hong Kong. Whilst clickbait is one thing, that's hardly the worst part of the video. Ricegum's Hong Kong vlog generally shows him being a public nuisance, disrespecting the culture of Hong Kong, as he goes out of his way to annoy and even bully members of the general public. Again, for obvious reasons, this got a lot of backlash, primarily from a lot of YouTubers based in or originating from China and Hong Kong. But also also people in the mainstream. They viewed his behaviour as immature and insensitive, and many compared it to Logan Paul's vlogs in Japan. Ricegum responded to this by making a video on June 26th called Why Everyone in China Hates Me, where he defends himself by saying it was just jokes, comparing himself to other comedians, and going over some hate comments he got. 
But the onslaught of 2018 wasn't over for Rice. On December the 31st, Rice would upload a video called How I Got AirPods for $4, in which he shows off the mystery brand website who had sponsored the video. The website was like a loot crate of sorts, where the user would pay money for a chance at getting various items, ranging from stickers to cars. In his video, you can see that he manages to get a lot of valuable items, but as with all loot crate scandals, something wasn't right. Again, many YouTubers such as h 3 h Productions and PewDiePie pointed this out and criticised Ricekin for his video, saying that he was promoting a gambling website to children. He quickly responded to them in a video where he says that other YouTubers did the same thing and were not criticised for it, only becoming an issue when he did it. Ultimately though, at the end of the video, he said that the damage was already done and put Amazon gift card codes on screen as an apology. They were later discovered to be redeemed months prior to the controversy. Of course, after this, he kept getting consistent views in the millions, and his concurrent viewers on streams were in the tens of thousands, but that was about the end of it for his public relevancy, as from there, his channel flatlined at 10 million. In 2020, he announced that he was moving out of the Cloud House, and since then, his uploading has been infrequent. In the same year, he also worked with Leafy, who upon his return, promoted their collaborative brand, Always Lucky. In 2021, having moved into the new Phase House in LA, he was also caught up in a pump and dump scandal when he and a number of FaZe members were influencer ambassadors for the Save the Kids token, marketed as a crypto token that gave a percentage of the investment to charity. However, soon after release, most of the ambassadors sold all of their stakes and the coin crashed, scamming most of the people who invested. Possibly to distract from this, he started having feuds with Aiden Ross that are now resolved, and also started having drama with KSI over previous experiences. His last regular upload since then was July of 2021, and from then onwards, he stayed radio silent, mostly focusing on building his own life and family. There was a teaser early this year in 2023 when he posted asking if he should come back, but the good mood was tragically cut short when he had to announce in April that he and his significant other had lost their child to stillbirth. Going back to 2017, soon after the formation and popularity of the Clout House, it wouldn't be long before the members got into yet more drama with Jake Paul. This seemed inevitable, especially since FaZe Banks had begun dating Alyssa Violet. In August 2017, Jake Paul would make a video alleging that FaZe Banks had assaulted one of his assistants at a club, saying that she was clotheslined by Banks, who gave her a bruise on the neck, reenacting a headlock that Banks supposedly did on her. Banks would respond a few days later with a 30 minute video, in which he refutes a lot of the claims. He shows proof that Nick Crompton of Team 10 actually contacted him previously and discussed the incident as if it were an accident, before Jake Paul's video came out that seemed to paint him as a much more aggressive individual. Banks would also point out inconsistencies in the assistant's story, and establish that there was a chance that he accidentally hit her while he was dancing. He would later bring in witnesses to explain the testimony of what happened at the party, and aired out his own suspicions that members of Team 10 were possibly trying to drug him. Later, he would do an interview with a Team 10 member known as Max Pumont, who was there during the situation. Max explained that he did not see Banks assault or forcibly kiss anyone, and that he was actually friendly towards them. Banks would end his statement by saying that he would not be able to share the security footage of the incident online, because he was getting lawyers and managers involved. And at the end of it all, Banks would gain around 1 million subscribers in a week, with Jake Paul losing 200,000 subscribers and going below 10 million. Flipping forward to November 2017, Banks and Alyssa Violet go out to a barley house for a Thanksgiving night. However, the night soon turns sour after the two get into multiple fights with the staff members, with Banks breaking his third finger on his left hand as he was fighting, and Alyssa's lip being busted open along with a black eye. Later in the month, the internet got their hands on the CCTV footage, in which many people saw that underneath his cap, FaZe Banks was actually balding. Now, Barley House actually issued a response to this incident talking about their side of the fight, and they assumed Banks wouldn't respond to them as they had successfully filed a restriction order on him so that he couldn't speak out about it. Three weeks later, Banks would then break the deadlock and respond to Bali House, claiming that he got a lot of lawyers just to make the video, and said that everything the Bali spokesperson said was a lie, mainly because he was not there during the incident. However, due to making that response, Banks was sued, went to court, and was forced to delete the video, paying $150,000 for making and publishing it in the first place which probably increases balding. Not a lot would happen with FaZe Banks for the next two years, as he was primarily a co-host of Keemstar's podcast, Mom's Basement. That's the thing, the point of the show is we want to talk about what's trending and what's popping right now. Why are you f***ing here, man? You're so old. But everything was thrown in the air again when in May 2019, Tifu would sue FaZe. During 2018, Tifu was one of the most promising new faces of the streaming scene. After being signed to FaZe in 2018 when he was just 19, Tifu would become one of the most well-known Fortnite streamers on the scene. 
yet behind the scenes there were collusions with contracts. In this video, Tifu says he was missing out because of FaZe Clan's connection with a deal he signed in April 2018, keeping only 20% of the revenue from any branded videos that were published on Twitch, YouTube or social media, alongside half of his revenue from touring and appearances. He also says that FaZe Clan pressured him to gamble and drink alcohol before legal age in their houses. Banks would make a response to the allegations on Twitter, stating that they were made up and lies. According to himself and the FaZe Clan, they collected no money from the tournaments or social media revenue and said that Tifu would collect millions during his time in the FaZe Clan. Banks would then reiterate that in his own response video on YouTube, as well as adding that Tifu was the one pressuring people into doing things. He would also mention a deleted video that Tifu uploaded where a party took place at his current girlfriend's house before turning 21. A BB gun was shot through someone's cheek as another stunt, and drinking was involved. In May, Tifu would hit back at FaZe Clan and Banks, explaining that he did not want the drinking and gambling allegations in the lawsuit, and explained his feelings on his contract ever since joining FaZe Clan, ending the video off by urging FaZe to release his contract to the public. Banks would respond by saying he would release the contract as soon as he could, but in the end, it wasn't him who would release it. The leak of Tifu's contract by The Blast News officially stated that Tifu got 80% of brand deals, 50% of merchandise, 50% appearance fees, and 20% prize pools, which sums up only having 50% of what he earns towards FaZe Clan. In August, FaZe Clan would counter sue Tifu, claiming he disparaged the team, stole his confidential information, and interfered with the team's other business contracts and relationships. Additionally, they claimed that Tifu earned as much as $20 million since he joined FaZe Clan in April 2018, and that is the last of what we've heard publicly about this lawsuit. Since his public drama with Tifu, FaZe Banks hasn't really uploaded ever since. His last involvement in something was removing the FaZe members who'd been involved in the Save the Kids coin, and he's just been living his own life, as the members of FaZe also managed to get their own house, although some have attributed the subsequent downfall to FaZe to his actions. In an Instagram post, he wrote, Hard quit social media a while ago. Haven't posted a main IG feed in over a year. No idea why I figured I should switch up and post something now, but here you go. Shit's exhausting. I spent a decade of my life caring. I just don't anymore. Everything's amazing, all is well. I've never been this calm slash happy. I love you guys more than anything. It's not because I don't care about you. It's the social media clout game. I'm just tired of it. The real ones, my real people, I'm in debt to you for the rest of my human life. You changed it forever. If you're reading this, you're partially responsible for me not being a complete loser. Lost. Sad. Nobody. Thank you a million times over. I genuinely love each and every one of you. Thank you. Until next year. Back to 2017, and in FaZe Banks' video on Jake Paul, Alyssa would come in the second half of the video to talk about her own experience with Jake Paul in more detail, talking about how Jake assaulted her multiple times. This ranged from being spat on during disagreements to being pushed into a prickly bush. She also called him a racist, sexist, and a homophobe. Anyway, since Alyssa and Banks were dating for a while, this means that their stories follow a pretty parallel timeline for the most part. She continued to date him and appeared in a lot of the videos, there was more beefy Jake Paul, and then there was the fight the Bali had. House. But things soon turned awkward after Banks made up with Jake Paul in May 2019 and made a video with him. This of course prompted a lot of people to comment in anger, either saying that it was all fake or that Banks shouldn't have made up with Jake Paul. But Banks clarified his position in the comments, saying this. Alright guys, so needless to say, but this might be the weirdest video I've ever posted. Before you pass judgement or jump to conclusions, I ask that you just watch the video to see how it all turned out. Alyssa and I ran into Jake at Coachella and the interaction was genuine and it was the right kind of conversation. That turned into us squashing the beef after a full year of being very public about how much we hate each other. Moral of the story, be the bigger man when the opportunity presents itself. Banks would also say this on Twitter. It's just a weight off both of our shoulders and it's lame internet drama. We ran into him at Coachella and had the right kind of conversation. We all decided to let the past be the past and move forward. Like I said, watch the video. You might learn something. Which is kind of shaky to me considering that the so-called lame internet drama included allegations of assault and manipulation. Inevitably, this would cause Alyssa to drift further apart from Banks in their relationship, and it would all end between them two months later. From what everyone initially saw though, the breakup was relatively amicable and peaceful until December, when the rug was pulled from underneath everyone. In a response to the tweeter that asked how did you find out you were being cheated on, Alyssa said, I was asleep upstairs with our dogs and he wasn't next to me, so I checked our guest house and caught him naked in bed with a random girl. Banks would respond by saying, I love you, and then Alyssa would respond to him by posting an entire set of messages. Goodbye. 
Dude, why? I love you. What the hell this? This ain't cool. I love you? Did you love me when you were hooking up with a random whore in our house? Did you love me when you snapchat that girl in Vegas to come fuck you when I was at dinner with you? Dude, what the fuck is this? I always cut my promises. Did you love me when I was in Orlando for our cousin's wedding and you hooked up with a girl in our bed? Alyssa and Banks then continued the back and forth online. Did you love me when I've been asking for five months to help out with our dogs, but you told me to ship them to my parents in Ohio because it was too much for you? I couldn't take care of them. I want them to have a good life. Why are we doing this online? Did you love me when you texted that girl that you were on your way to a hotel room at 6am to get weird whilst I was sleeping next to you? Did you love me when you said you were a highlight room but I had your location and you were at a random apartment complex for two hours? Did you love me when you broke eight of my phones? Did you love me when you smashed in the back of Chantel's window of a card that she gave me? Did you love me when you fucked all the girls I was worried about whilst we were dating after the breakup? Banks would post a response to this in which he generally talks about how, from his perspective, neither of them were perfect adding that he would not allow the details of his intimate and private relationship to become a spectacle online. Again, you can take what he said in whatever way. Since then, Alyssa has been mostly on her own, doing her own thing, posting occasional vlogs to her channel. She went on to the BFFs podcast to say that she's generally just been taking care of her mental health, and since then has become friends with Banks again, and has still been tweeting to this day. Since she was an Instagram model and not a YouTuber, Summer Rae's position in online drama was very different to any of her peers. There was also the fact that her Instagram following was massive in the first place, so no one really fucked her over early in her career. That's not to say that people didn't try though. Back during late January of 2017, Summer's manager reported her to be missing after she and her assistant went to Mexico for a quick photo shoot, declaring she had been kidnapped. The photo shoot was meant to take two hours, but she had been gone for over 15 hours before she posted on Snapchat letting people know that she was safe. We just want everyone to know that we're okay and that we're safe. Sorry guys, thank you. Whilst the event was traumatizing, a lot of people jumped to say that it was staged, with others even making videos saying that they had proof, but this would be far from her most eventful controversy. On the 3rd of March 2018, a YouTuber by the name of Solowin tweeted about how he hadn't been paid for editing some of Summer Rae's videos, saying this, it's been months and I still never got paid for the videos I edited for Summer. I tried to discuss the matter privately, but it seems her or her management don't want anything to do with me. Uploading a video on it soon because I'm honestly tired of this shit. Just a week later, Solomon would post a video talking about his experience in much more detail. He had made 12 videos and thumbnails for Summer, being owed $600 in total, which might seem like a lot, but for someone as rich as Summer Ray, that was pocket change. Not to forget that it also all divides out to around $50 per video. Throughout the messages, Summer also brings up issues that wouldn't exactly be a problem in her very high position. From monetization issues to signing payment, to her computer crashing so she couldn't send her videos and had to get an editor closer in LA. Of course, these are all real issues any creator would face, but for someone in the clout house like Summer, these would be insignificant, easily dealt with. Even if she wasn't monetized yet, she did clearly have the money to pay Solomon for his work. Later on, when Solomon asked for his money, Summer's management team told him a lot of lies. This included details about their proceedings and Solomon's work, as well as them saying there were copyright claims on the video, even though that's incredibly easy to disprove. At the end of it, they wanted him to settle for a credit in the description, but eventually Summer supposedly conceded and asked for Solomon's address. Except that was a false promise. Any of Solomon's follow-ups on that within the next three months were ignored. And in fact, as a result of this initial tweet, Summer Rae's representatives said they were getting their legal team involved and threatened action if he would make a video. It wasn't long before people like Keemstar would take notice of this, and just a day later he posted a drama alert video where he talked about the situation, actually going out of his way to pay Solowin $600 as a gesture of goodwill. And now with one of the biggest drama channels now airing the story, Summer Rae would post a response trying to refute the claims, although it was quickly deleted and if you read it you can probably see why. That's because in the response she tries to weasel her way out by claiming that Solowin had agreed to being paid with description credit, that she does three months trials with editors, that he was unreliable in sending videos over, and that he was now doing this for clout, ending it off by saying she quote, doesn't deserve hate for some lies a little kid makes on the internet. This didn't look good for Summer to have this arrogant response, especially when Solowin's initial video had been very calm and reasonable for a topic where he got fucked over that hard, and in Solowin's response to this he continued to disprove her claims. Eventually Summer would message Solowin with an apology and the two talked things out as she sent him his money and the situation concluded. However, many people thought that even if it was over, Summer's actions were too little, too late. And they would be partially right, as later in 2020, Summer and Faze Banks went onto the Mom's Basement podcast and once again continued to talk shit about Solowin, reiterating the same points about clout chasing as Summer once again reverted to her lies. In the end, the Solowin situation would be a huge signifier to those who hated the individuals within the clout house. It basically showed that Summer seemed to have the same arrogant and vindictive attitude 
attitude as the rest. Over the next few years, she continued to post on Instagram and would have flurries of controversies here and there, like in April 2019, when she posted this tweet, saying, If you have an OnlyFans link in your bio, we can't be friends. Now this would have been an epic, chad, base, red-pilled post if it wasn't for the fact that Summer Rae had unashamedly used her own body in order to get her Instagram audience in millions. Or as this Twitter user put it, I still can't believe Summer Rae, who got famous for posting videos of her shaking and jiggling her blank and thongs, shamed girls who do OnlyFans. Sis, you're not better than anyone because you show your blank for free. For the rest of 2019 and onwards, Summer would continue posting her fitness videos on Instagram and later moved over to TikTok, where she started to make contact with some of the most popular people there. She also continued to make appearances in the Clout and Phase House and would also be entangled in the Save the Kids scam. She would begin possibly dating TikToker Taylor Holder in 2020, although the details were shady, but later broke up with him. On another episode of Mom's Basement, Summer primarily talks about her relationship with Taylor Holder. In the podcast, Summer claimed that Taylor was still in love and even contacted her boyfriend due to this. In particular, she said that Taylor was trying to get back together with her whilst he was with Charlie Jordan, another popular TikToker. According to Summer, Taylor cried to someone saying this. I love this girl, you need to stop talking to her. Taylor would respond to this by going on the BFF's podcast and claim that his and Summer's relationship had been super toxic. He stated they often broke up and there were trust issues, going on to give examples of things that went wrong in their relationship. Right from their fight during the 4th of July to Summer thinking you might be cheating, Taylor admitted their relationship was not healthy. The podcast ended with Taylor stating that he has always wanted to be on good terms with Summer, but the same reaction was not reciprocated from her end. He further added that he and Summer had not spoken in a long time. As of now, Summer Rae has also just been living her life and continually posting on her Instagram to this day, which now has over 25 million followers. She's also been filmed doing DJ sets and went on George Jankel's podcast to discuss how she had been offered $40 million from OnlyFans to join the platform, only for her to reject the offer in favour of becoming a Christian. Despite how big her following is, it's fair to say she won't be returning to the mainstream limelight anytime soon. Leaving the weirdest individual out of the cloud house for last, Wolfie's inclusion was an interesting decision. Wolfie wasn't exactly a guy who made the same kind of content as his peers, as much as it was just soy facing at large quantities of materials slash food. But regardless, he was in the cloud house and he featured in all their videos. In November 2017, he would embark on trading diss tracks with chunks of all people in probably the year's most convoluted drama. It all started with Big Shack, a parody rapper who went viral after he made his track Man's Not Hot. Though it started blowing up and charting in the summer, Big Shack would release a music video for it in September of that year, which is where this all stems from. Now, the music video featured Waka Flocka Flame, Lil Yachty, Jim Jones, DJ Khaled, and Chunks, who plays the part of Asni. Then, when reacting to it, Wolfie would make a few jokes towards Chunks. I need to go back to see Asni. Why is Asni the biggest goon I've ever seen in my life? Why is he giving the camera? Chunks would then hit back by making his own diss track towards Wolfie, which featured a brief cameo from Big Shaq. And in the diss track, he also features Wolfie's previous group, Team Albo, whom Wolfie abandoned in Canada for Clout Gang. Team Albo is also, by Toastify's official race index, the whitest diss track feature of 2017. Wolfie would make a diss track responding to them by going directly at Big Shaq in his song, Check the Statistics, feat Rice Gum. Now, you might be looking at that thinking that Rice Gum featuring one of those tracks should have made it gone viral. But what you're missing is that Ricegum actually isn't even in the video, nor does he actually record any lines for the video. It's all just reused from Ricegum's video. Check the statistics. Check em. My clout higher than yours. Proof if you check the statistics. It's big. With the Lord is my witness. Take this out, you don't miss it. Ricegum said you are relevant. relevant. Facts. Check the statistics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, no, it's not reused from Ricegum's video. That's Idems' video border. What the fuck? Now obviously, saying someone is in your song when they're not is probably against some sort of terms of service, but Wolfie tried to justify it because Chunks put a featuring Big Shack in his diss track and he wasn't in the diss track. However, what Wolfie again fails to mention is that Ricegum never was on his track or recorded any original lines, whilst Big Shack was at least in the video. If anything, this sort of drama highlighted why people become so tired of diss tracks lately. The cyclical nature of milking shit like this until it was dead was so recognisable and easily spotted as a money grab by the audience. In his video on the situation, Commentary YouTuber Will and E points it out more clearly. With any online beef, right, you don't just make the one video. So you make the reaction, and then the behind the scenes, uh, side note, make that one look like it is the diss track. Then you make the actual video, and then you jump in two follow up reaction videos to your own video. My mom reacts to my diss track, she cries. Jesus Christ! No wonder he's got his best Gucci bag on, man. He really is a 25 stone Morgs. And then bang, right, doesn't he 
even stop there. It's me, David Parody, also part of the pull your maddest face you possibly can in your thumbnail gang. Bloody hell, mate, you're really liking the look of that burger, aren't you? Well, he made a reaction video to it, and it's 10 minutes. It's a four minute song. How have you managed to get mid rolls out of this? However, this would not be the greatest controversy Wolfie is known for. Ever since joining the Cloud House, Wolfie had been acting a bit weird. It wasn't just the LA change of personality as opposed to Canada, but also his behavior in his relationship had been pretty weird. He would ask his girlfriend Sylvia to sometimes stay in an Airbnb whilst he hung out at the Clout House, and as it turns out, this had been a very pretty dark reason. In May 2018, an Instagram model by the name of Jasmine would come out to say that she and Wolfie had been dating. This included messages, recordings on the FaceTiming, pictures of her in the Clout House, and pictures of them sleeping together. Keemstar and his news team would soon get to hold the story and find tweets that solidly proved she was 15 to 16 and at the time, Wolfie was 24. Yet the reaction to this incredibly concerning age gap was one of resort to talk about how Wolfie had cheated on his girlfriend, when surely shouldn't the fact she was 15 be more important? Well, according to the girl herself, she was not 15 or 16. To everybody that keeps saying I'm f***ing 16, eat my butt because I'm not. Which led most people to assume she was 17. Now that still isn't great, but sorry, wait. Hold the fucking phone. There is a tweet where she literally says she is three years from turning 18 in March 2017. Keemstar got in contact with her classmate who provided a picture of her class badge showing that she entered sophomore in 2018 and people blindly believe her word over it? Oh, she wouldn't have a motive to lie? Hey, maybe someone who's an Instagram model at 16 doesn't really want the feds involved. And how a 15 year old was let into the clout house is just beyond me. Keemstar would later release an interview with Jasmine where she talked about her motives behind leaking her relationship with Wolfie. It just so happened to be like me being tired of him mistreating me and like, I don't know, I just felt like a little, like I was just put in a shell and I had no say in anything and I don't know, he posted something on his Snapchat that triggered me. What he and said? And it was obviously like, no, like the Snapchat was of him and Sylvia and like she was just blowing kisses to the camera and I like, I don't know, it triggered me because it's so sad how he was still letting this continue and he would get separate Airbnbs for her to stay so like I could go see him and stuff. So I was just like, Wait, wait, you know wait, what? time I'm out, time out. Are you mean to tell me that like he would go somewhere and get two Airbnbs, one for his girlfriend, one for you? No, he would take me to the clout house so that like she would stay in the Airbnb while I was at the clout house with him. When she could have went to the clout house and stayed with him, you get me? But no, he would tell her, get, like, get your own Airbnb. Okay, this isn't the clout house anymore. This is fucking Little St. Banks. A few days later, Sylvia would make her own video called How to Survive Heartbreak, where she talks about the effects of Wolfie cheating on her. I definitely drank way too much, so... I mean, it's 3 p.m. I've been kind of recovering. Yeah, when is anyone going to mention the minor part or Wolfie breaking the law? I mean, was <laughs> what was Wolfie Raps cheating cheating on his girlfriend or were you guys just flirting like, back and forth? It was 100% cheating. <laughs> so like 100% like hooking up, hooking up. Yeah. Okay, cuz the, the the reason why I asked this is cuz in like California, right? Wolfie Raps is like life is ruined, right? Because like in California, the age of consent is 18. So if you guys were hooking, hooking up when you were 17, I mean, he's fucked. I don't know, maybe my Hollywood theory is right. The closer you get to the Hollywood sign, the higher chance you have of being a predator. A few days after this news, Bangs would kick Wolfie out of the cloud house. However, despite the ugly circumstances, Wolfie has largely gotten away with everything. Sleep with a 15 year old? Oh, it's all fine, as long as you just keep making the same content for the last few years after amending the bridge with your old team which you left for cloud. Oh, girlfriend of mine that I cheated on with a high schooler? You wanna get together? Sure, what could go wrong there? Hey, I'll make a music video for you too. Listen, Wolfie hasn't uploaded for almost two years. He's probably just moved on for his life. He's probably just starting his own family or whatever. I don't know the pinpoint details. So I'm really not going to go on our weekly. The one who got away with Crusade, but fucking hell. Everything I've heard about this case just fucking disgusts me and everyone was concerned about the other thing. I'm puzzled. This shit needs like a deeper look into it. Someone needs to like look deeper into this and what actually happened. In conclusion, what can we say about the legacy of the Cloud House? Though it was an entertaining place, a lot of people found the members of the Cloud House to be pseudo celebrities, annoying, arrogant, and obnoxious. It was a place where the internet seemed mostly split on opinions, but in the end, even though all these people made a lot of money, their career decay is somewhat bittersweet. 
I and many others always turn back to Roadshow's Ricecom diss track as a good summary for everything that happened to this group of YouTubers. As for the actual house, after the end of a year and a half lease, FaZe managed to extend it for a bit more, but eventually sold it to a group of expiring creators and a whole different platform. And the cloud house of yesterday became the hype house of today, which itself has gotten in a lot of hot water. Now the cloud house just stands for rent, with a price of $40,000 a month, waiting for the next big online influencer group to step inside its walls. But until then, until next time, stay toasty. Thanks again to Raid for sponsoring this video. Scan my QR code or click my link in the description to download and claim your bonuses.